see all of your faces. This is a good looking group. I want to welcome everyone to our work session and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, do we have a motion to come out of closed session? I move that the school board having been in closed session pursuant to a proper motion come out of closed session. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a couple of seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, we're going to move by ward, signify by saying aye, and of course, nays and abstentions have the same opportunity. Bob Holt, Ward 1, aye. Connie Smith, Ward 3, aye. Marcel Williams, Ward 4, aye. Andrea Shelton, Ward 5, aye. Terry Johnson, at large, aye. And Amy Phillips, Ward 2, aye. We are out of close. Do we have a certification of our closed session? We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Again, moving by ward, all those in favor signify by saying aye. And of course, nays and abstentions have the same opportunity. Bob Holt, Ward 1, aye. Connie Smith, Ward 3. Michelle Williams, Ward 4, aye. Andrea Shelton, Ward 5, aye. Terry Johnson, at large, aye. And Amy Phillips, Ward 2, aye. Our closed session is certified. Um, do we have any motions from closed session? I recommend that we approve the um, employment agenda as meeting number 10. We have a motion to approve the personnel agenda with the exclusion of line item 10. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Again, moving by ward, all those in favor signify by saying aye, and of course, nays and abstentions have the same opportunity. Bob Holt, Ward 1, aye. Connie Smith, Ward 3, aye. Andrea Williams, Ward 4, aye. Andrea Shelton, Ward 5, aye. And Amy Phillips, Ward 2, aye. That Terry motion. Johnson, at oh, large, yeah. aye. <laughs> well, we're just all out of order tonight, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's our April Fool's for the night. Good one. Next up is approval of the agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda agenda as presented? I move to approve the, the agenda as presented. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? This time actually moving by ward. All those in favor <laughs> signify by saying aye. And of course, nays and abstentions have the same opportunity. Bob Holt, ward one, aye. Connie Smith, ward three, aye. Marcel Williams, ward four, aye. Andrea Shelton, Ward 5, aye. Terry Johnson, at large, aye. And Amy Phillips, Ward 2, aye. She did good that time. That motion carries. Next up is moving down to the consent agenda. We've got a lot of items out there this week. Um, the first one, and we've had a discussion about this, is the um, bill system, which I know um, Mr. Phelps is a little excited about. Um, You'll see that purchase order in front of you for $71,274.21. Next, next up is um, a request to change the academic calendar. Dr. Sterling, did you want to speak on that? I believe the only reason it, um, the proposal is because of the actual week that Easter falls in, that it, the the calendar was presented with Easter at the same, at, with spring break at the same time we have it this year, but Easter that year is actually on either the 17th or the 18th. Okay. So we're just switching it to fall in line with that Easter. 
Any questions on that? <coughs> Next up is the SPED annual plan. And just as a reminder, all of these moving from the SPED plan down on through um, the Perkins, every year we have to approve these um, for submission. So these are approval of those um, grants. So we're looking at SPED um, and then the title grants and Perkins. So the first one up is SPED. Dr. Sterling, was there anything you wanted to say in reference to any of these? <coughs> Then behind SPED is Title I, no changes. Behind Title I is Title II. Again, no changes. Title, and next up, 3.6 is Title III. is the limited English proficient. Title IV is next behind that, 3.7, which is for student support and academic um, enrichment. Same thing, no changes. Um, Title V is item number 3.8, which is the rural and low income school program. Same thing, no changes, the same exact request as um, current year. And then next behind that is um, Perkins, which is CTE. Um, the only change with that is the inclusion of the criminal justice track, which we've talked um, many times about. Looking at implementing this is looking at going ahead and getting that up and running for the 2021-2022 school year. And then the last item is 3.10, which is minutes from our March 4th work session. Any questions on any of the items in the consent agenda? I have a question about um, school district, the English proficiency. What percentage of, um, okay, where did my train of thought go? What percentage of um, like Hispanics or individuals where English is not their first language? What percentage of students do we have in this in the building? I want to uh, refer that to Dr. Cotton and Ms. Ellis and Ms. Ellis. E L L, that's the name of it. Excuse me? Okay, thank you. percentage we have in a division of those that where English is not their first language, the oh, ELL oh, language. Sorry, we have two, uh, we have two of all the okay, thank you. to the consent agenda. Hearing none, do I have a motion in regard to the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. I second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of moving by ward signify by saying aye and of course nays and abstentions have the same opportunity. Bob Holt, ward one, aye. Hunter Shelton Ward, five, aye. Terry Johnson at large, aye. Amy Phillips Ward, two, aye. The consent agenda is passed. Next up is special recognition. 
Um, we, I am going to turn that over to Dr. Shelton for the presentation of this special recognition. Dr. Shelton. Dr. Sterling, will you stand please? Whereas, in order to ensure the health and safety of all Virginians, <laughs> schools across the Commonwealth closed on March 13, 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and most have provided virtual instruction since then as in-person teaching and learning evolved and Whereas individual school divisions retain autonomy to decide whether or not new instruction will continue and the format in which the instruction will be presented. And whereas stable and consistent leadership by local school division superintendents has been vital in serving children through this pandemic. And whereas school division superintendents are responsible for the health, safety, welfare, and education of each child while creating school cre cultures, even within a pandemic that serve all children, regardless of their circumstances. And whereas public school division superintendents utilize guidance from the Centers for Disease Control, Virginia Department of Health, Virginia Department of Education, local health departments, and local case data in fulfilling leadership responsibilities in their communities like no other time in their careers. And whereas local school division superintendents work collaboratively with their school boards, educators, parents, and community stakeholders in providing technology, resources, curriculum content, emotional support, and meals to children during the pandemic. And whereas traditionally VASS superintendents of the year have been selected via a diverse panel of education associations after reviewing an individual superintendent's ability to demonstrate leadership for learning, communication, professionalism, and community involvement. And whereas all 133 Virginia Public School Division superintendents have extraordinarily exhibited these qualities while leading their school divisions and communities during the 2020-21 school year, and whereas the VASS Board of Directors agreed on January 7, 2021, to suspend the traditional selection process of determining a single superintendent of the year and unanimously agreed to recognize and honor all Virginia Public School Division superintendents as superintendents of the year for 2020-21 and whereas VAS is appreciative of the Virginia School Boards Association supporting this resolution and the honor provided to each division superintendent by having her respective school board present this resolution to the superintendent to be recognized within the community for which she serves and leads. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Franklin City School Board does hereby recognize Dr. Tamara Sterling as a Virginia Superintendent of the Year for 2020-21 as designated by the Virginia Association of School Superintendents. Adopted this first day of April 2021, Franklin City School Board.
still being said by Dr. Shelton. <laughs> Do we have a motion to accept the VAS and VSBA Superintendent of the Year resolution and proclamation naming Dr. Tamara Sterling as a Superintendent of the Year? I so move. We have a motion. Do we have a second? A second. second. We have a motion and a couple of seconds. Any discussion? Then moving by ward, all those in favor signify by saying aye, and of course, nays and abstentions have the same opportunity. Bob Holt, Ward 1. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> aye. Andrea Shelton, Ward 5, aye. Terry Johnson, at large, aye. And Amy Phillips, Ward 2, a resounding aye. That motion passes unanimously. Congratulations again, Dr. Sterling, and thank you again for all you do. All right. She really didn't want me to do that, just so y'all know that. Um, next up, we will be moving down to item number five, human resources and federal programs. Any questions for Dr. Holland on that? That's wonderful to hear. And I, and I heard, I think it was today, it might have been yesterday, that they're anticipating, I think it's 18 and up, all adults. By April 18th, they will open it up for all 18 and up. So that would even touch some of our student population. Dr. Holleran. Next up, finance and operations. Good evening. Good evening, board. Um, this is just the March vouchers. Um, uh, same report that you see every month. Uh, this report is not uh, very large. It doesn't have a CSEP payment in it, so these are just your normal bills. Uh, I reviewed it earlier, and I didn't find anything out of the ordinary, uh, unless you folks have any questions. This is just a voucher for mine. Any questions for Mr. Ryder in regard to the vouchers? Okay. All right, Dr. Ryder, I guess, I know Mr. Ryder, I guess you will be moving right on with the group health insurance renew yes, renewal. Yes, I will. Yep, on the, uh, on the next presentation, it's the uh, group health insurance that, that goes out every year from our uh, broker, Pierce Group benefits and uh, 
they, they came in with three different uh, carriers uh, proposals this year. Um, going to the next slide. Um, so uh, in this year, I, I can summarize the numbers for you pretty quickly. There's only three or four numbers we're gonna really look at that make any difference. But there were issues that were non-numerical. One of the issues was that um, uh, Anthem, the insurance carrier that we are currently under, um, backed out of having Walgreens as one of their in-network pharmacy providers. Um, and then I, after I did some Google research, I realized a whole bunch of insurance companies are doing that with Walgreens for whatever reason. Um, mm -hmm. And then the secondly, uh, probably the, the bigger issue is that the Bon, Secu bon Secours uh, Medical Facility here in Franklin City is where roughly 30% of the claims of our population of of uh, employees that went to for treatment and Anthem and Bon Secours has fallen out. They're not, they're not, uh, Anthem is not going to uh, have them in their network. So what that means to the person is that it's gonna be like an out of network, right here in Franklin is gonna be an out of network uh, facility. It's just like they went to Texas or something. So, um, so though, and that was, uh, kind of an issue when we were talking to them. And then the third issue is that we actually had a decrease in medical claims, but we, Anthem wanted to raise our rates 5%, 4.89%. So um, here, on this one here, there's something called health disruption report. Uh, I pointed to the two things, that Southampton Memorial there, uh, you know, out of all the claims uh, that, all the claims we had, 171, I don't know why it's on two different lines, and 52, 220 claims out of the roughly thousand, that's about a fourth of the claims were just at that one facility. So when they, when they say that they're not gonna, they're gonna treat it as out of, uh, pay, out of uh, network, then the, you know, the deductible goes up, the copay goes up. It's kind of bad for our, our citizens, our employees. Uh, you know, it's a lot of numbers, but uh, in the center there is the yellow. Uh, that is the Anthem renewal figures. Um, so down, in the, down at the totals down there, uh, about $1.5 million. Five, uh, it's about a $70,000 increase. Now remember, the $1.5 million five is the total, but the employees pay a big chunk of that. Um, so it's $1.5 million. Five. Uh, the next guy over under blue is Optima. Come on, Optima. And theirs is about $1.427 million. Four twenty seven. So they basically was a flat line. And then all the way over to the right is United Healthcare. Their quote came in at a million four fifty eight, <laughs> halfway in between. Um, so um, and op, uh, so the next slide. Um, well, that was just the, the health disruption report down there in the lower left is kind of what what it means if you're in or out of network. So you know your deductible for a single folk. If you're out of network, if you're in, it's a $500, but now if they're single and they go to the bond scores, it's $1,000. Um, the stunning mo maximum out of pocket for the family in network's 8,000, but if you know you go to the same place you were going to last year, it's 20,000. So pretty tough sell. So um, the recommendation, so our recommendation is obviously to keep our, our costs the same, uh, go to the Optima network, uh, Franklin City's hospital is in the Optima network. And, um, you know, we really don't have a health insurance increase for this year. So that's our recommendation. Any questions? You mentioned that other insurance companies were looking at um, not doing business with Walgreens. Yeah. Is Optima still doing business with yeah. them? Have yes, Optima still, yeah. Uh, uh, Walgreens. And Walmart, by the way, uh, the two W's, Walgreens and Walmart, are in network with Optima. Any other questions for Mr. Ryder in regards to the health insurance renewal? All right, thank you. One thing I will comment um, for those that have not been on the board um, very long. This, the health insurance renewal has been um, a challenge for the division for the last several years because we had gotten to the place where Anthem was our only option um, because we 
other we couldn't transition carriers because of claims in the past so our our renewals were increasing quite significantly every year so this is actually good to see these numbers so low for the increase in premiums mm -hmm. yeah yeah so it's good to see that that is leveling off some to where that that increase is not that much every year a motion do I will entertain a motion in regards to um, the health care renewal? I move to accept the recommendation for Franklin City Public Schools selection of Optima for it to be group health insurance carrier beginning October 1st, 2021. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, moving by ward, all those in favor signify by saying aye, and of course, nays and abstentions have the same opportunity. Bob Holt, Ward 1, aye. Aye, Ward 3, aye. Marcel Williams, Ward 4, aye. Andrea Selfman, Ward 5, aye. Terry Johnson, at large, aye. And Amy Phillips, Ward 2, aye. That motion does carry. Next up is curriculum and instruction. Ms. Burkhalter, good evening. Good evening, school board chair Rob Smith, school board members, Superintendent Sterling, staff and community. <laughs> Dr. Sterling has everybody skipping tonight. She let me know so professionally I'm the longest presentation standard between her spring break tonight. So. <laughs> well, don't let us hold you up. I won't. I know the principals <laughs> concur as well. So um, <laughs> I provided the slide here for you, and um, as Ms. Moore um, brings up my attachment. I just wanted to provide you an update that we're holding our monthly meetings that started in October. We currently have 26 new teachers participating in the class and they are just so engaged and transparent and take risk and they're very vulnerable. And I wanted you to see some of the samples of their work that they provided. Um, and they try to make it applicable to what's going on in the classroom. So you see here, they had to create newsletters about formative assessments, the pre, the post, the summative, and they had to create it as though they would give it to their mentor or one of their colleagues. So at the end of the year, the principals will have these in a Google Doc and they can share them out the following year when needed to be for support. So even the teacher's tale, I love that that was um, Mr. Pullum, uh, Mr. Phelps. Um, so you can just see here how they bring in their creativity, their own um, personal style while they have their new learning. So I just wanted you to see some samples there. And then um, we have two classes left. We have April and May, and Mrs. Moore will send you all a formal invite for our last class, May 3rd. And right now the new teachers are currently working on their district-wide initiative where they work in groups. Um, last year we didn't have it because of COVID, but right now what they're doing is um, a project around building a virtual network and so there's five professional developments that will be divided out between, they will present to each school, central office staff, and then we'll come together as a district on the last Friday in April to kick off New Teacher Week. They have a mastermind session, um, which is kind of like a red table talk with Jada Smith or Masters Opal class. Um, so it's gonna be interesting. I don't wanna give everything away, but um, once we finish with those, they'll be recorded and they'll be posted on the school website pending Dr. Sterling's approval. Next, we have a mentor update. So with the new teachers, we need mentor support. So in January, in preparation to prepare for us coming back in the brick and mortar, we um, opened up the mentorship program. And so as Ms. Moore pulls up the attachment, I wanted to provide you information here that on January 19th, I met with the mentors and um, I provided the topics that we covered from why mentor training, understanding the needs of the teacher, um, all the way to good mentors building rapport. And all of this information was provided from the Virginia Department of Education best based on research best practices. They submit their monthly logs and one was due today. Um, and so as you can see here, one of the things that I've incorporated this year with the new teacher, I mean with the mentors is having them kind of in parallel go through what the new teachers are going through. And one of the things I like to push them towards is being reflective practitioners. So what got you to being where you are and why do you want to be a mentor and what made you be a good mentor? So their first article that they received from me is why the good mentor. So they had to read that 
um, article, and then I created a PowerPoint slide for each um, mentor, and they had to respond to each individual one. So like Erin Miller right there, her reflection was about she is a good mentor, and she became a mentor because her mom was a teacher, and that's what made her get into education. So for me, I can relate to that. Why met Ms. Parker? She, um, as her reflection, she had put that one of the things and skill sets that she's going to bring to the table with her mentee is communication. She loves to talk and she loves to listen, and those are the two effective pieces to communication. Now, ironically, the day after she submitted this, she had a data meeting, and she didn't want to talk. And I'm like, well, I just read your reflection yesterday, and you said communication was yours. But again, you have the mentors pulling in and reflecting, but not just, okay, I'm going to read the article, but here I'm making it applicable. And again, at the end, we have this to share with the mentors next year so they can see what the previous mentors did because everybody loves an exemplar. Any questions on the new teacher or mentor update? Okay, great. So, Dr. Shelton, at the last school board meeting, you um, – reviewed the data with the other school board members, and per the usual, you had a probing question to make sure we're pushing the envelope, and we appreciate that. So you asked, had we thought about a transition program? Now, I'm not going to lie to you. You know, it was like on the 13th hour that day, and I just said, okay, we'll think about it. But you know it bothered me driving home, because I'm like, that's a sterling. <laughs> you know we have a transition program. No, that's it, but I was just too tired. But I do want you to know, we do take the heat, which you always say. And so I had the instructional team pull the data for the last three years, and we comp condensed it down to one. Because one of the things I know that I can pride FCPS on is we look at that data. The principals look at it. Then they pull their school-based team. Then as central office staff, we look at it with Dr. Sterling. Then we all come together with the principals, the school-based team, central office. And I'm like, I don't think we would have missed that. But let's come through that one more time. So last week we took two hours with the instructional specialist team. I had met with them. And we looked back through that data. And we didn't just look at it by school, by grade, or by subject. We look at it like we always do. We broke it all the way down to the individual child. And so to answer your question in a nutshell, do we need to build in to the current transition program we have supports for those fifth, sixth grade, or eighth, ninth grade transitioning from one building to the next? in math and our reading based off of that preliminary data that we target them for summer school? And the answer would be no, and it's for various reasons. Um, one, that data you was looking at, we're no different than most of the 132 divisions going on with the COVID data. When we looked at it for the last three years, even when you start with the elementary, by the time they get to the high school, they do recover. Mm -hmm. Within the transition program each year, the principals with their school-based teams have the autonomy to alter the transi transition program because they're not transitioning those students just off of academics. They're also transitioning them off of social and emotional. So just like last year, we shut down for COVID. The students didn't get the opportunity to go to the building, but the principals created videos for them to have the virtual tour with the experience and in incorporating the staff. And then we do have summer school. And one of the things we did know we were gonna have to do, not for the ones transitioning from building to building, but from starting all the way at the lower is, we're going to have to do something different for kindergarten through second. So that's why we shifted them to have a summer school and built that in, which you all approved last month. Mm -hmm. So again, some of the outlying factors within the data, a cohort may have been on a grade level where we didn't have licensed teachers that year. Mm -hmm. Or when Dr. Sterling came in, there wasn't tutoring funding. So when you track that one cohort that's sitting at the high school now, again, they have recovered from elementary to middle school. Okay. And I put the rationale in there for you. Thank you. Do you have to, you're welcome. <laughs> Do you have any additional questions, comments, concerns? You covered it. Thank okay, you. thank you. <laughs> any board members have any questions on transition? Okay, thank you. Very thorough. Thank you. We tried. Dr. Shelton pushes it. Okay, so next, exciting news. I know you all have seen on the news starting in December 2020, Amazon wants to partner with um, different curriculum programs and get into the public school systems to support the initiative with computer science. Well, Amazon has um, partnered with Coder Z Curriculum, and they have an Amazon Future Engineer grant. And so what it will do is give us the first six months free, and then we get a discount because we are a Title I school for S.P. Morton and J.P.K. But after talking to her today, because we're school-wide, 
um, district-wide free and reduced lunch, they will also give that discount to Franklin High School. So essentially what will happen is, um, Penny Wilson and myself met with um, Ms. Kathy two weeks ago to go through this grant. And I must say, I'm very excited about it because it is very student engaged. It is built like a gaming system. It has a leaderboard. Um, it already merges with everything that we have. Oh, let me stick to the PowerPoint. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, Tim. So the first, I'm sorry, Dr. Sterling. Okay, so the first slide was just me highlighting what you will find on the BDOE website. And it's about the governor's initiative and the state's initiative. They've altered the com co um, computer science curriculum and they have put in $1.35 um, million into computer science so that we can have more students coming out with that. So with that being said, Coder Z is a coding, yes, thank you, yep, you can keep on going, Ms. Moore. It is a coding curriculum that also embeds curriculum. And the great thing about it that um, Tammy Wilson loves is because it embeds that science and math, we can easily ship this into the classroom or we can do it in isolation and have the media specialist doing this with the students. Um, it is online, which is great, as we've learned because of this year. Now, here with this PowerPoint, what I want to emphasize to you all is that last bullet, the equity in the era digital. So one of the things is with this is going to support the students getting curriculum, I'm sorry, computer science jobs. And as you know, right now, computer science is growing at an 8% with job openings over any other jobs right now. The second thing is with this curriculum, the teachers don't need experience and it comes, comes with professional development, which would be embedded in our price. And the third thing is, oh, I already noted that with the equity. Next on the next slide, Ms. Moore. So again, here, this is just emphasizing that Coder Z is a curriculum. It comes with teacher guides, and it also builds in virtual robotics competitions. So they have two types of competitions. You can keep on going, Ms. Moore. They have a global competition, which is, um, it's typically in the fall, and they're building that out right now and pricing that. It's probably going to be around $400 per team, they said, three to $400. And then they have the competitions virtually where you can do them all year, but it's within the district. So they are competing with their peers. It's still leaderboards and all of that. And the data is still collected. So, yes. So again, just stressing that this curriculum works with syn synchronous, asynchronous, or face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. yep. Next slide, Ms. Moore. Okay, so go back, Ms. Moore, to the pricing slide. So, if you approve, we get six months free. Okay, after that, the license would be for 12 months, so we have it for a total of 18 months. For the first six months, we can have up to 120 students on one license with each teacher as we're demoing it. And right now, Tammy Wilson, Tammy Wilson is demoing this with um, Brandon Yana and some students between JPK and the high school. So, they recommend that we do two courses at each school. At JPK, we would do Coder Z Adventure and Cyber Robotics 101. At Franklin High School, we would do Cyber Robotics 102 and Python Gym. Now, you see here we would get a 50% off discount. So the Coder Z Adventure would be 2,400. Then the Cyber Robotics 101 would be 1,200. For the high school, the same thing. The Cyber Robotics 102 would be 2,400. Then the second course at 50% off would be the Python Gym for the 1200. So that gives each one of them 3600. Then we get 12 hours of professional development, which is built into the price for 1800. So that would be $9,000. And then any, again, um, competitions that we participate in, we would have to pay for that. So with that being said, do you all have any questions about the future Amazon engineer grant and their partnership with Coder Z in the curriculum. Hi. Um, okay. I just had a question about the pricing again. Yes. Um, is, is it 2400 for the first, but then each of the other three are only 1200 or? No, so you, so we're buying one, so we're getting one fifty percent off per school. Curriculum pack has four, it's 
So that's if we were at one school. We're not doing the all pack. We're only doing two courses per school. Okay. Because that's what they recommend for us to start out. And I'm a firm believer, and Dr. Sterling will tell you, we need to go slow to go fast. And so to take on all four courses would be too much because we still have to identify the teachers and we can do two courses even if we take one per semester. But to do four at each school would just be too much starting out. Great question, I asked the same thing when we got the presentation. But if we were to add like a third one at SP Morton or JPK, we would still get 50% off that third course. But up until we get to four courses at each school, would we be allowed to do that four packs for 4,450? I mean, if you're gonna add a third course, you might as well do the four packs and it'll be cheaper. Absolutely, but we're not going to the first Right, right. no, I, I get it, I get it. But I was just confused because, yeah, all right. I'm good. Yeah, I tried to do the same thing and clump them together. <laughs> um, how does this, well, maybe I won't ask it like that. This looks like a modified Scratch program. You okay. familiar with, are you familiar with Scratch? No. From MIT? Well, it's coding and robotics as well, but when I look at just this base presentation, it looks like modified Scratch because Scratch, they can do robotics and different things like this, but this looks like it has more to offer. It definitely does, and they started getting into technology talks where Tammy Wilson got very excited and she knew what the lady was talking about, which is why I knew to have her in that meeting. And the great thing is too, it utilizes Clever for the students to log on. And so we're already utilizing Clever so we can embed it. And Tammy Wilson has been teaching coding over at JPK for the last two years as the media specialist. So she feels like it would just go right along with what she's been doing for the person that will replace her as well. Okay. Okay, if no questions, I'm just seeking your approval for us to accept this. If so, then that funding will be built into the Title I grant for next year under I, the online programs. I have one question. Yes, ma'am. Um, what are, how do I phrase this? Um, how, what is our expectation of how this is going to support the curriculum and what, I guess, what is our intent with this? Is it supporting STEM education? Are we looking at it catapulting like into the vanguard that we're, we're doing with the students that are moving from the middle to the high? That so great question, it would be both. So as um, everyone knows, Mr. Parker is headed to the blue and Dr. Sterling wants JPK to be the STEM flagship. And so this plays into that vision. Um, and it's just adding another layer. We have Jason's learning, but now we have a curriculum that's supporting it, and it's student-centered and engaging our students. And when you think about the high school, they're already doing robotics. So now as those students move, and that's why we have the high school doing 102, not 101 even for the first year, because they've already been doing robotics. Mm -hmm. We already have the students with the math background, and that math goes to higher levels. The great thing about this online program too is it tracks the student's data and it does a heat map. So it already color codes it off of the traffic light system for the teacher and moves as the student is moving and working. I think that's one piece that, because robotics and, and we've, we've talked several times over the years about the success of our robotics team. Mm -hmm. but the numbers are so small with participation in right. that because there isn't much of a taste for that type of experience within the division. I think this is a great opportunity for kids to get that taste and maybe spark that interest. Agreed. So. Any other questions, comments? Hearing none, do we have a motion in regards to the Amazon Future Engineer Partnership with Coders Need? I move approval. We have a motion to, from Mr. Holt to approve the recommendation for Franklin City Public Schools to utilize the Amazon Future Engineer Partnership with Coders Z to cover the funding for the Coders Z software. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Any discussion? 
Moving by ward, all those in favor signify by saying aye, and of course nays and abstentions have the same opportunity. Bob Holt, Ward 1, aye. Thomas Smith, Ward 3, aye. Marshall Williams, Ward 4, aye. Andrea Shelton, Ward 5, aye. Terry Johnson, at large, aye. And Amy Phillips, Ward 2, aye. That Thank you all. Carries. And lastly, still going along with your last question, why this coder Z? Well, we're moving towards having JPK as the STEM flagship. So we're already partnering with Jason's Learning by purchasing their curriculum. Well, now they're offering for us to be a part of a partnership to where we can be get certification, STEM certification. So they have built a platform to where um, when you go into the platform and you're working with your either central office team or school-based teams, um, you can assess where you all are and create your plan for where you need to go. And it's all around STEM. So um, the areas of assessment on the first slide um, on the um, right, you see the domains that we have. And so the domains were divided out between the schools and um, Dr. Sterling and Ms. Brooks because we're embedding some of this into the gifted plan as well. And they self-assessed where the district was. And then we came back, you can go to the next slide, Ms. Moore. So I have a timeline how everything happened. Um, I did a trainer training with Jason's Learning, then met with the principals and Dr. Sterling, and then trained them, and then the principals went with their school-based teams, and they um, could um, utilize the platform to assess where we were as a district with their school-based teams. And the school-based teams consisted of the principals, a st um, staff from the other school, teachers and a member from the gifted department, whether it was Ms. Ricks or Ms. Sherlock or um, the future um, gifted teacher coming up. And then we came back together, we looked at the samples that were uploaded, looked at where we rated um, ourselves as a division to create next steps, and then we submitted it. And right now we're waiting for um, feedback from them back, but we're with three other districts. And um, the thing about being a part of this certification pilot is they ask us to be very transparent. And even the other three districts were very low in a lot of areas. And so that's the thing that they want to stress. This is a tool for you to assess where you are, get your baseline data, and then develop your plan for where you want to go. So once we're through all of this pilot with them, they will share this nationally. And we, along with the three other districts, will be STEM certified. So we just wanted to make you aware that we were a part of this STEM certification pilot. Do you all have any questions in reference to that? All right, Very thank good. you. That concludes my report. Thank you very much, Dr. Burke. Oh, Ms. Burke Alder. <laughs> all right. Moving right along, next up is the report of the superintendent, Dr. Sterling, superintendent of the year. Yes, yes. <laughs> all right, thank you. First, I have the report of the superintendent, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for staying uh, uh, this late. I mean, you really didn't have to. Ha, ha. <laughs> 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 but I'm going to do the report of the superintendent. All right, let's move on to the next slide. The report of the superintendent is focused on our hybrid instru instruction, just giving the board a uh, background of what's been happening for the last two weeks. SCPS began hybrid instruction three days per week following Governor Northam's suggestion on Monday that Monday, March 15th, all schools need to offer some form of in-person instruction. At this time, hybrid instruction is happening at all three schools. 152 students are taking advantage at S.P. Morrison, 65 at J.P. King, and 53 students at FHS. Now, you know we always come to the school board with data because that drives our decision making. So at high, when we look at SP Moore and hybrid students, I want you to look at this pie chart for tier one, tier two, and tier three. Now, just to give the board a refresher, as you know, tier one is usually our top tier kids. They're moving, they can get it really quick. Our tier two kids, they're getting it. They may need a little bit more assistance, but those are our bubble kids. Nine times out of 10, we're gonna get them over to the other side, but they need a little bit of work. Tier three kids are usually working below grade level and expectations. And those are the kids we really need to wrap around services, support, tutorials, things of that nature, really to ramp them up. And like you uh, alluded to earlier, to 
to close that achievement gap as they begin to move upward in the higher grade levels. But as you can see, for S.P. Morton, tier three students, and I'm very, for, very, very excited to thank our parents because the majority of our kids that are coming back are the kids that need the support. And we are very happy about that. We want all of them back in the building, but the majority of the kids that are getting that one-on-one -on -one, uh, support in a small classroom setting are our tier three students. So as you can see, 23% of our students, excuse me, 25.3% of our students that are at SP Morton are tier one, 20% are tier two, but 54.7% of our students at SP Morton are tier three. And I, don't, I, I can't be any more excited than that. So just want to make certain that you have the numbers. J.P. King hybrid, tier one, you have 6%. So it kind of gives you that idea that your tier one kids pretty much can work remotely. They can uh, get that instruction. They can move and turn their assignments in. They're just rolling. They're just doing well. So at this time, you have 6% of tier one students at J.P. King. 33% were coded um, level two, tier two. And 61%, 61% of the students that are attending J.P. King are in tier three. Getting that small classroom, individualized attention, which I, I truly believe is going to support minimizing that learning loss when we come back full time next year. So with that said, you have that data. We really don't tier them at the high school level as much as more so at the elementary and middle. So the recommendation to the board is I would like to see a modification of the schedule. I would like us to really seize the moment and take advantage of working with our students that are tier three and they are in our building. So I'm asking the board to uh, increase the hybrid schedule to four days of in-person instruction with one day, which is Friday, continuing to be virtual. I think we need, the data tells us that our kids are in the building, the ones that need the most support, and we will need to be able to work with them as much as possible in a small classroom setting. Are there any questions? Any questions or discussion? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the advantage to the four days transportation was going to be a question for me uh, because right now it's just I'll use the high school as an example you've got um, 9th and 10th on two days and then you've got 11th and 12th on two days so now you would be looking at 9th through 12th four days a week how will that impact transportation when you have 9th and 12th when we talked about them that's not even 50% of the building is that correct Mr. Thomas? And tra transportation-wise, like the buses, for four we, days. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I, I work with all the players before I'm bringing this to you. Absolutely, and for but five days for my for my teaching staff would, would be almost like a ticket shop. Oh, I work. <laughs> Any other questions or discussion? Have we seen any 
changes in COVID to speak of since we came back? Um, as far as the number of COVID right. cases? Right, increase, or? decrease. We're, 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 we're still in the red. And, um, you know, as we look at the numbers in Franklin, but I think, again, it's going to start going down. This is just, you know, my, you know, off the cuff because we're getting so many people vaccinated. So we're just going to keep looking at our numbers, but we're just fortunate that in our classes and in our schools with everybody there, we're still less than, uh, like you said, we're less than 200. I think you'll be less than three, maybe three at that. making decisions for the school district. Good. But if you pull up the DH, it, we're, we're in red. <laughs> I don't think there's hardly any place in the state that's not still well, in red. That is but. True. No, but if I could just interrupt for a second, I think that the Department of Health is starting to feel a little bit more comfortable with the way things are looking because I know it was mandatory that I get tested twice a week at work and now they have, I think our second or third week of only being required once a week and so there has to be changes in numbers in the community or in our health district uh, mm -hmm. so for them to do that yep. so there has to be some shift somewhere in the positive direction that's true any other questions any discussion oh and the only thing that i would add is that this would take effect april 19th i apologize monday april 19th have we seen, because um, I know when we first discussed coming back into the classroom, having students come back into the classroom, when we first had that discussion, um, the way we had approached that was if students chose to come back into the classroom, um, if something happened, there was a possibility of flexing that virtual, but if they chose virtual, then we, they were staying on that track for the remainder of the year. Have we seen any acts yeah. of students that were virtual wanting to come back into the classroom? Absolutely, and, I, and, and again, thank you for that question because we have to actually take each uh, individual student on a case-by-case -case basis. So what the principals have been doing is having a running list of students that are requesting to come back into the building. And then they reach out to the parents and if and only if they're able to come back into the classroom with the three feet, you know, they, they lowered it now, the three feet and, and, and everybody else will still be comfortable and be able to socially distance, then yes, that's not a problem. But if they are crammed in there and it's too many, then we have to uh, tell them they have to stay on their first choice. How, and that brings up another question. With the change, the CDC guideline changes from the six feet down to the three feet of distance, have we gone back and made uh, and rearranged classrooms according to that, or are we sticking with how we had been No, prior? we're going back and we're doing those rearranging. And so our uh, assistant, Sue, she has already started looking at that. Which will allow us to accommodate more students within a classroom uh, as well. It will, but we want to make certain we keep we're comfortable where we are, right. put it like that. So, and the kids are doing well. The only way we will reach out to see if a parent would want to come to hybrid, if a child isn't showing up for virtual, really not being successful, and we know we have to do some outreach. So because they are at home, doesn't mean we're not going out. We need more support tutorial services, if you don't want to do hybrid, boys and girls have 21st century, come after school, do this. We, we, we know our community and we want to support them with wraparound service. And I can't say that enough, uh, but we are as flexible as we can be within guidelines. Are there any other questions for Dr. Sterling on the proposal for the hybrid? the increase of the hybrid plan. Hearing none, does anyone wish to make a motion in regard to the increase in the hybrid plan? I move to accept the superintendent's recommendation to increase hybrid instruction days to four days per week beginning Monday, April 19, 2021. We have a 
motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye, and of course nays and abstentions have the same opportunity. Ward 1, Bob Holt, aye. Ward 3, Frank Smith, aye. Russell Williams, Ward 4, aye. Andrea Shelton, Ward 5, aye. Terry Johnson, at large, aye. Amy Phillips, Ward 2, aye. That motion carries. So oh we will be transitioning you. to four days a week in person for those in the hybrid model, four full days a week for those in the hybrid model, beginning April the 19th. Yes, I'm very excited. Thank you so, so much. Next, we have the strategic plan timeline. We have been working off of the last strategic plan for um, at least a year or two. And I must say, it was a very good, robust uh, strategic plan. And a lot of the information that was in it has not was not implemented. So we were really working off of that plan. And I must say that uh, about a good 70% was really what we needed to be doing to lay the foundation for where we are right now. You know we started our strategic plan conversations about a year, year and a half ago, and we have our committees together. They, they were meeting at first, and then COVID hit. So now we're going to, I'm, I'm um, bringing this presentation to the board because I would like to work with VSBA to help us with the strategic plan and guide the work. A lot of our, uh, works, our, our workshops that we do they would come and do that with our community. And here is the timeline. May 3rd to the 21st, they would survey our teachers, start community meetings. Dates are still needed. We haven't given them that yet. This will be a SWOT analysis, and you know they do an amazing job with that SWOT analysis, so that would be excellent. With community members, open invitation. Selection of participating stakeholders, survey students, staff, and community members. Next you have, and that would be the deadline was May 21st. June 25th, 1.5, we even put our master board training in there. We're going to start talking a little bit about the strategic plan, but the goals that the board sets for themselves every single year are embedded in that plan timeline as well. July 1st, facilitating, facilitators meeting with superintendent to go over survey results. Stakeholder feedback meeting to establish goals, objectives. And we don't really want it that big, but really a core concentrated group because the last strategic plan, I think it almost had like 60 people on it or something. So we, I, my recommendation is that we don't have that many people. 20 people, 25 should be enough. September, 20, September 15th, meeting with staff to establish action steps. October 12th, stakeholders update, and then final presentation. And of course, you know there's a lot of homework that goes in between after all of these meetings. So my team, curriculum instruction, of course you have a section on operations, uh, teaching and learning, all of that will be encompassed in our new plan. And I'm just excited because our new plan will um, have in it the new teachers academy. Our new plan will have Vanguard, task force, increased dual enrollment, our new plan will have our CTE credentials, uh, uh, making certain that we keep up with the trends of what's happening in our city and connecting programs to support our city, which will be criminal justice. Our new program, excuse me, our new strategic plan will talk about a redesign for early, early high school at the middle school. So a lot of stuff that we're doing, we're just crunching it down into a document because this is the direction that we're going in. And I love it because we have the STEM consortium, uh, like Ms. Burkhalter said, we are one out of about, I think it's seven districts actually, Ms. Burkhalter, one out of seven districts nationally that are going for the STEM certification for the entire, um, you know, for the district. And we're starting with JT King and moving up to SHS. So we're happy about that. And that will go into our strategic plan. So you have a lot of things going on that we're doing but it needs to be condensed down into a document so people will know this is exactly where Franklin City Public School is moving. They are accelerating, they're, they're accelerating, innovating, and transforming. I think I've talked the longest I have in a long time with you all. 
but that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Any questions for Dr. Sterling on the outline for the strategic plan? All right, this is going to be exciting. And our one-on-one -on -one initiative will go into our strategic plan, so it shouldn't be, be, be difficult at all. All right, thank you, board members. I appreciate you, and I'm going to take my seat if there are no further questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Sterling and team. Um, that was a lot of information. Um, next up, I don't know, Dr. Sterling, would this be you too, the graduation plan for Franklin High School? I'm going to help you along, Mr. Phelps. <laughs> When she said she was done, she said she meant she was done. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a different microphone or something. Okay. I don't know if I know what to do with it or not. There we go. All right. Fr the graduation is coming June 4th, 2021. So it's right around the corner. We have a plan. Um, the governor on March the 17th did a press release that went into effect actually today, April 1st which is the third amended executive order to th the third amended executive order 72. And as far as the graduation and commencement section of that um, document, graduation events held outdoors are capped at 5,000 people or 30% of the venue capacity, whichever is less. And I'm um, giving you this information to kind of lead you up to what we have decided to do for Franklin High School's plan for graduation. If you have a graduation event indoors, and it is a difference between graduation events and sporting events. Um, for some reason, the numbers and percentages are different, and sometimes I get the two mixed up. But for graduation events, it's capped at 500 people or 30% of the venue capacity, whichever is less. Attendees must wear masks, follow all other guidelines and safety protocols and to ensure proper distancing. And all guidelines for graduation, and there are 29 of them. Um, I brought the document with me, but you can Google it if you um, Google um, Governor Northam graduation and commencements. You'll see the, the 29 guidelines for commencements. All of them will be followed on June 4th, 2021, no matter what venue <coughs> we end up at. And, our, and we do have a, a plan A, our first option. This year, and we've done, since I've been here, I thought about it, we've actually had graduation in four different places. We've done it at Armory Field. Lately, we've been doing it at the Workforce Center because that's a very nice facility. We've had graduation in the gym before. I actually remember that when um, I was a teacher and Miss Gillette was the interim principal and she actually read the, that graduation book by Dr. Seuss that went on forever. So I'll never forget that graduation and the air conditioner wasn't working that day. Um, so that was in the gym, and then last year we had graduation in the auditorium um, individually, w one at a time. So f we, we can definitely be flexible and ad adaptive and have is, is several places that we can do. But this year, because of the capacity um, rules and our seniors have made it clear that they would like to graduate wherever they can get the most tickets for their families to be able to see them graduate. Um, we've had several senior meetings, and um, that has really been the overwhelming um, outcome when we discuss graduation. Um, can we get as many tickets as possible? So for us to do that and to stay in compliance with the governor's guidelines, Armory Stadium in Franklin will, will be our best option. The thing about Armory Stadium is you don't know about the weather in June. You know, thunderstorms, heat, um, which is why we've kind of uh, preferred the workforce center in the past, but because of capacity, Armory Stadium, the home bleachers uh, have a capacity of 2,000. So 30% of 2,000 is 600. We're expecting about 75 graduates, maybe a little more with GEDs, maybe a little less. That would be eight tickets per graduate, and we're going to print tickets that work for inside and outside and we and we've done this before when we had graduation at the at the football field so inside and outside tickets would be accepted if it's at the football stadium armory stadium graduates 
teachers and administrators will be seated on the field away from the bleachers with plenty of social distance so we wouldn't count in that number of 600 we, we wouldn't um take away from 600 mm -hmm. uh, and that's in the governor's guidelines too um if you if you read them carefully and for the people who can't get a ticket and we have we've done this in the past anyway it'll be broadcast on fhs facebook live we have anytime we have graduation at the field we have to have a plan b even if it's not COVID. so because of weather so our our plan B for inclement weather is the Workforce Development Center, and I put or the FHS gym. We're on the Workforce Development Center's calendar for June 4th, but right now they're not allowing anyone to use the Workforce Development Center because of COVID. There, it, um, Camp Community College has already announced they're having their graduation online, not in person. So um, I'm not 100% sure we can, even though we're on their calendar, we might can't use the Workforce Development Center. So the FHS gym would be um, the OR there. Both facilities seat the Franklin High School gym, actually according to fire code, is 824. Um, the Camp Community College Workforce Development Center, they have 732 of those red, red, reddish maroon colored chairs. So 30% of 800 is 240. 75 expected graduates. In, in this case, if we have to move inside, our teachers and staff would not be able to attend because we'd be trying to free up more tickets to our students. So it would just be the four administrators on stage is my suggestion, the three, me, the two assistant principals, and Dr. Sterling. Um, three that would give us three tickets per graduate. So the three inside tickets, because we'll print two different types of tickets, either color-coded or looking... If it's outside, all eight of them that the graduates get will work. If we get a thunderstorm in the middle of the day and we just can't do armory field and we have to make a last second switch, they'll know the other the, the three different color tickets are the only ones that'll work on the inside. Teachers and staff would not attend, broadcast on FHS Facebook Live. Um, the Camp Community College Workforce Development Center would be our first option if we can use it. Um, I love the Franklin High School gym, but we don't we would have to get our um, plastic computer lab chairs and classroom chairs to fill up the gym. And the chairs and the facility at camp is just a, a little bit nicer in our opinion. Um, but we can make it work in the gym or the Workforce Development Center. So that is our plan for graduation. Um, we, we're going to try to return. Some of us graduated at Armory Field. I know I did. It's, it's nice out there. If the weather is nice, it's a great place to have graduation. But if it's one of those weeks that um, we're having thunderstorms every afternoon as 95 degrees and it can be hot. But the seniors have made it clear they want as many tickets as possible. Mm -hmm. So I think um, with the guidelines that we're under right now, that is our best option to accommodate as many family members to come to graduation. Are there any questions from me? Everybody just keep your eye on the weather forecast for that week and pray for no rain and no heat. Um, I was out there one time where Mr. Jones was the principal, and we didn't, um, we, we didn't even get to announce anyone. It, the, the, the lightning was off to the right or left or whatever, and he just pronounced everyone graduates of Franklin High School, and we literally ran out the stadium because it started to pour. So... Um, we're going to call it Flashback Friday. Hopefully we won't have an experience like that. <laughs> Any questions for me? Any questions for Mr. Phelps? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, business by school board members. Do any school board members have anything they wish to share with us or with the community? I will share that we did have um, the SBA Master Board Training for the first time last Friday. I thought it was very productive and went very well. Um, next session is on the 23rd of this month, um, so we'll be looking at that later this month. Me, anything else? I'd just like to say that the last 12 months especially has been a challenge for everyone. It's unprecedented in education. 
anywhere in the United States that I'm aware of. Uh, but I think we went and adjusted as very well. We went to virtual fairly easily, I think, because we were set up to do that. The staff was set up to do that. Um, when we came back, we went to hybrid and some virtual and everyone cooperated. The COVID shot offers were made and people were very cooperative with that. A lot of divisions we read about teachers don't want to come back if, unless they all get vaccinated and all those kinds of things. So we never had to deal with any of that. And a lot of that relates to leadership and a lot of that are the people in this room tonight. Uh, the teachers, of course, the staff here tonight, the assistant principal of on here, they had a big part of that. Uh, our students and our parents. So I know the board feels like we know what you do and we know how hard you work and we appreciate it. Thank you. Anything else from any board members? All right, next up, upcoming events. Um, I know nobody is excited that tomorrow starts your spring break. Um, and, and I know you are gonna be so sad to not be here to come tomorrow, um, but we feel that you deserve that week off. Um, starting tomorrow so um, I know I have a child that is has already been, told me that um, she is not being woken up in the morning so good luck um, have a great week off please take some time and get some rest and do something for yourselves and enjoy yourselves each and every one of you deserve this break this will really honestly be the first real real break you, you did have winter break but this will be the first real real break where I think you can actually take a breath and relax so enjoy it um, our next meeting will be on April the 15th that is our regular meeting um, right now the plan is for that to be virtual which brings up another um, topic for us to discuss as a board as we transition students back into the classroom we have remained on the schedule that we set according accordingly last July, which was work sessions in person and regular meetings virtual. Um, do we want to stick to that? Uh, do we want to change that up any? Are we good on that trajectory of continuing that in that manner? Does anyone have an opinion or comment on that? I'm fine either way. will of the board to the will of the board and it seems like most everyone is fine either way whether it's in person or virtual and I think that's a great offer a uh, great um, point that you make as well um, in consideration for the staff that does have to come in and clean and do all of that um, so if, if no one has a preference then we'll continue as we're doing now I think that does facilitate as well it's a little bit easier for some people to participate online. Um, so, and you know, if people, one one good luxury about that is on days that we, and we've had some storms recently on nights that we've had board meetings, that does allow the opportunity for, if our staff is working and have to drive a long distance, they can work remotely if allowed and still participate in the board meeting. So if, if there's no objection, then throughout the rest of this, year will and I'm, by year I mean the end of the cal the school calendar year we'll continue doing this the way we're doing it um, work sessions so our first meeting of the month will always be in person and then our regular meeting which will be our second one will be virtual all right so next meeting is on the 15th closed session will start at 6 open at 7 that will be virtual 
Um, and then I mentioned Master Board training, and then that will take us into the month of May. We will already be in May before we know it. Any questions? 9.3 is our next item, which is just minutes for review. We've got our minutes from our regular meeting last month as well as our joint session with City Council from last Monday. Mon yeah, last Monday. Wow. That week flew by. And then our final item, which is everyone's favorite item of the entire evening, adjournment. Do I even have to ask for a motion? No. <laughs> Would anyone care to make a motion, or do we just all want to stay with our Superintendent of the Year? Second, second. <laughs> I hear a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, we'll take one more vote by ward. All those in favor signify by saying aye, and of course, nays have the same opportunity. Aye. Swore to I. We are adjourned. Again, Dr. Sterling, congratulations and thank you for all that you and your team do.